Hi, I'm Jan van Deun, and in this video, I'll be going through the basics of using size exclusion chromatography for the isolation of extracellular vesicles. So as the name says, size exclusion chromatography, or SEC, is a size-based fractionation method. In the context of UV research, this technique is very efficient for removing free proteins or smaller particles, such as small life proteins, from a sample of interest. The advantages of SEC are that it's generally fast, it doesn't require any specialized equipment or much know-how. It is reproducible and results in a high recovery of EVs. The downsides are that because it is a purely size-based separation, particles of a similar size, such as larger protein aggregates or certain classes of lipoproteins, will be co-isolated with EVs. Also, SEC will dilute your EV sample, usually by a factor of 2 to 5, and so there's often a need for downstream processing to obtain a concentrated EV preparation. To explain the principle of SEC, let's take a look at what happens when you load the plasma sample on top of a SEC column. So the plasma sample contains EVs of different sizes, but of course also a lot of soluble proteins and lab proteins. The SEC column itself is a stack of polymer beads that have pores of a certain size, and the size is called the size exclusion limit or the cutoff value of the column. So as the plasma sample enters the column, proteins and particles that are smaller than the size exclusion limit can enter the inside of the porous beads, and as such, they will be delayed. The bigger particles will, however, go around the beads and can, can travel faster through the column. In the end, this will lead to a successful separation of the larger particles from the smaller ones, and the first fractions that are collected from the column will be enriched in larger EVs and similarly sized particles such as lipoproteins. The later fractions will, will contain the larger majority of the free protein, and if they are there, also EVs that were smaller than the size exclusion limit. In this graph, you can see what a typical elution profile of a SEC column looks like. So on the x-axis, uh, this shows the fractions that are collected from the column after adding the sample on top. Uh, typically, these fractions are about 0.5 or 1 ml in volume. On the y-axis, you can see the concentration of EVs in blue and free protein in red. So the very first fractions are usually not collected because they are devoid of any EVs or protein. And this uh, volume is called the void volume which is actually the volume of the mobile phase of the column, so basically the buffer that is around the SEC beads. After elution of the void volume, the next fractions will contain all particles that are larger than the cutoff size. And then finally, particles will elute that are smaller, such as proteins and smaller EVs. So you can see that in this particular case, we end up with a large fraction of EVs that is relatively devoid of contaminating proteins. These are fractions 4 to 6. Um, but we also have an overlap between the smaller EVs and the free protein that was in our starting sample, so fraction 7 to 10. It is important to remember that SEC is not a one-size-fits-all method. There are many ways to tweak SEC-based separation by adjusting several parameters. And the parameters involved are input volume, column dimensions, and size exclusion limit of the beads. Each adjustment can impact many aspects of the separation. For example, if you increase the column length, this will uh, probably uh, lead to increased EV purity. It will also lead to a longer time to elution and a larger elution volume. So in that sense, an increased dilution of your EV prep. Going back to our earlier example, here I have illustrated how increasing the column length while at the same time decreasing the pore size of the beads could lead to a better separation of all EVs, also the smaller ones, from the bulk of free protein. So it does also result in increased sample diffusion, resulting in a larger number of fractions that need to be collected, 10 in this case, and thus an increased dilution of your EV sample. In this table, I have listed some examples of commonly used resins for EV isolation by SEC. So you have the Cephro CL family, which consists of agarose with different percentages of cross-linking, and these beads have pore sizes of 75 nanometers down to 24 nanometers. Resins with smaller pore sizes, such as Cephro CL6B and SuperDEX200, will limit loss of EVs and focus them at higher concentrations in a smaller number of fractions. But at the same time, this might also lead to contamination with protein if the column is not large enough. So keeping in mind that the performance of a SEC column is affected by its specific characteristics, in general, we can state that the recovery of EVs larger than the exclusion limit of the beads is close to 100%. This was, for example, determined by measuring the concentration of fluorescently tag tagged EVs before and after separation. Do keep in mind that when using a resin such as Cephro CL2B, which has an average pore size of about 75 nanometers, 
smaller EVs will be isolated only with very low efficiency. In terms of EV enrichment, SEC is usually capable of reducing free protein contamination to about 0.1% compared to EVs. Also, high-density lipoproteins, which have a size of less than 20 nanometers, are efficiently removed. Uh, the low-density and very low-density lipoproteins uh, with a similar size range as EVs will only be removed by a factor of 4 to 5. Um, the time to elution of EVs from a SEC column is again dependent on the specific column parameters, but usually around 15 minutes when using, using small columns and elution by gravity flow. SEC is theoretically scalable when there is a need to process larger sample volumes. However, if you increase the sample volume, this will have a big effect on the necessary size of the column. So as a rule of thumb, the sample volume should be only 5% of the total column volume to ensure a decent separation. When using larger columns with elution volumes of several tens of milliliters, it is, it is advisable to automate the column elution, for example, by a pump system, and to establish automated fraction collection. Since SEC typically dilutes the EV sample, meaning that the EVs elute in a larger volume than the sample volume that was loaded onto the column, there is often a need for sample concentration, like via ultrafiltration. This will, of course, increase the time it takes to obtain the final EV sample and might also affect EV recovery. A pre-SEC concentration might also be necessary for relatively dilute samples such as urine to allow employing a smaller column. When testing or optimizing a SEC protocol, it is advisable to first make an elution curve of the number of particles and the protein concentration in each fraction. The number of particles can, for example, be measured using a single particle tracking method, which is explained in a different um, video. Since most of these technologies cannot differentiate between EVs and other particles of the same size, the fractions with the highest particle to protein ratio should then be tested for the presence of EV proteins and absence of potential contaminants. So finally, when attempting to reuse a SEC column, it is advised to always thoroughly check the alley weight after washing to confirm that there is no leftover protein um, or RNA that would cause cross-contamination between samples. This can be especially important for clinical applications. So some do's and don'ts are listed here. Um, some practical tips if you want to make your own columns are to try to avoid introducing air bubbles when pouring the columns, as these will negatively affect your separation. Also, you must take care not to disturb the top layer of the stacked resin when pipetting in the sample or elution buffer. You can always add a frit on top of the column to avoid this issue. Uh, biofluids such as plasma or, or saliva can vary from patient to patient in terms of density or viscosity, which are properties that could affect the sec based separation. Therefore, it is advisable that the elution profile for this type of fluids is routinely checked, and if necessary, you could add a pre-sec dilution step. Um, there are different manufacturers that are marketing set columns for EV isolation, which are quite expensive, but they generally work well. However, as with any commercial product for EV isolation, one should always carefully test these products so we can, for example, use the quality controls that were mentioned on the previous slide. Um, to conclude this lecture, I have listed a few examples of SEC for EV isolation. So this paper here uh, by the Neeland group was actually the first publication that demonstrated the feasibility of SEC for EV isolation. Then there are some more uh, recent publications which have, have explored different types of SEC resins and column dimensions to further optimize the performance for EV purification. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, SEC is a purely size-based method, but there are also other principles such as density, charge, and immunophenotype, which can be exploited to separate out EVs. So combining several principles typically results in a higher relative enrichment of EVs versus contaminants. And indeed, a number of groups has, have successfully combined SEC with other methods, such as the density gradient or even other types of chromatography, such as ion exchange, in order to obtain an EV sample of higher purity. So some of them are listed here. Um, here are the references that I've used throughout this presentation. And finally, um, I would urge you to also check out the other lectures in this ISAP Massive Open Online course.